uh, Rastko Mochnik is a philosopher and sociologist. He comes uh, from Slovenia. Um, he belongs to this uh, group of, I would say, uh, generally uh, Yugoslav philosophers, not only Slovenia, Yugoslav philosophers uh, who started to publish uh, uh, already in the, let's say, late 60s, the beginning of the 70s, and it was very productive, the production of not only the, 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 the praxis philosophers, but all over the former Yugoslavia. So it was quite open uh, uh, public space, and especially uh, open for uh, intellectual experiments. Uh, so th there were many different schools of philosophy, of, of, of thought at that time. Uh, in Zagreb, more or less Frankfurt School. In Slovenia, French philosophy, Althusser, Lacan, psychoanalysis. In Belgrade, more uh, analytic philosophy, but generally Marxism, mm -hmm. different forms of Marxism everywhere. Uh, as you know, the, the former Yugoslavia collapsed 1991 in war, and, and then has been collapsing through through a chain of of wars during the the, the, the whole decade of the, of the 90s. And uh, uh, Rasko Mochnik, uh, 1995, published a book, which Extravagancia is the title, uh, uh, and one part of of the book uh, is uh, essay uh, uh, with the title How much fascism, which you, you already feel what is the problem. It is not the question whether there is fascism or not, but how much of it. With how much of fascism can we live? So, and we uh, immediately come to the, to the problem, uh, how to talk of fascism, where is this fascism? Uh, according to the hegemonic ideology today, according to, uh, to the uh, uh, ideology of the European Union, fascism is in the past. And this is precisely, precisely what uh, explicitly European Union and uh, European Parliament defined by distancing itself from the so-called two totalitarianisms, describing the whole European project, the project of European integration, as a post-totalitarian project, politically uh, and ideologically. I, 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 will have, I have several quotes, several documents of uh, fascism that uh, is believed to be somewhere in the past, but uh, about fascism that exists in the present. And I go through these few quotes so that you get, get an idea about or uh, help us to answer this question whether is fascism a matter of a, of, of, uh, or a problem we should deal with in, in the current reality, political and historical reality. So it was in the April 2009 European Parliament voted uh, on a declaration that condemned totalitarian crimes and called for the recognition of communism, Nazism, and fascism as a shared legacy. Everything is put together. Auschwitz with uh, universal health care, <laughs> socialist health care, and socialist welfare state. Uh, different forms of, of socialism. The fact that actually Yugoslav, so-called self-management socialist socialism, declared Soviet-type socialism as a, a form of monopoly capitalism that is worse than the, the Western one. Everything has been forgotten. There is only one legacy, legacy of totalitarianism. According to this legacy, uh, according to this logic, fascism is in the past, left behind. And we live in a world which has liberated itself from uh, 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 both totalitarian, so-called both totalitarianisms. But let's, let me jump directly into, into the reality. Uh, so as to argue how fascism plays crucial role in the shaping of our uh, actual political reality. You know that a week ago, uh, 
Syriza and the whole uh, uh, Greek project that, that, that started to find challenged the concept of uh, uh, austerity, the politics of austerity had to retreat uh, from this radical anti-austerity politics. Uh, it was the extension of the, of the bail, bailout program, Greeks bailout program, and it was uh, experienced as a defeat, as a retreat from, from the promises of Syriza. Um, and even a few days ago, there were riots in, in Athens, this time against, against the politics that promised to, 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 to challenge austerity. Uh, we all somehow believe that Syriza was squeezed into the corner, has no other option, and had to, had to uh, admit the defeat. But it's not that easy. Fascism play, played a crucial role in this decision. Uh, a few years ago, Yanis Vasoufakis, Varoufakis, uh, the uh, now uh, uh, minister, uh, finance minister, uh, 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 Greece finance uh, minister, gave a talk in Zagreb uh, about how he became erratic Marxist. And it was a few weeks ago published in Guardian. And I will uh, uh, take a quote from, his, um, uh, uh, fr fr from this talk. And he writes, he uh, says, a Greek or a Portuguese or an Italian exit from the Eurozone would soon lead to a fragmentation of European capitalism, yielding a seriously recessionary surplus region east of the Rhine and north of the Alps, Germany, uh, while the rest of Europe would be in the grip of vicious stagflation. Who do you think would benefit from this development? Asks he. A progressive left that will rise phoenix-like uh, from the ashes of Europe's public institutions, or the Golden Dawn Nazis, the assorted uh, neo-fascists, the xenophobes, and spiffs. I have absolutely no doubt as to which of the two will do best from a disintegration of the Eurozone. So you see, it's a logic. It's not a contingent uh, element in the story, a uh, decision uh, under the pressure. It is the logic. It is the threat of the fascism. And even more explicitly, Vars uh, Varoufakis says, I, for one, am not prepared to blow fresh wind into the sails of this postmodern version of the 30s. If this means that it is we, the suitably erratic Marxist, who must try to save European capitalism from itself, so be it. <laughs> but what is the motivation? It's a fascism. It's a fascist threat. This is the logic. This is the logic behind this attempt to save Eurozone and Euro. So this is my first <laughs> argument that fascism exists and shapes really concrete political reality today, the, the, the fate of Europe. This is uh, what, what those who challenge, who challenge this uh, capitalism say themselves. Uh, <clears throat> and just to, to remind you, it is not only today. This is also experience uh, Rastko and I share from former Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia this catastrophe or, or civil war, uh, this um, feeling that we uh, had this experience, again, experience of fascism. And that generally, the situation uh, of the so-called transition, post-communist transition to democracy after the so-called democratic revolutions, that it has something to do with fascism. Not by chance, uh, the beginning of the book the uh, uh, Rastko uh, open, opens the, the, his, his essay with uh, a quotation from uh, 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 one journal, uh, refugee, uh, journal. refugee journal, actually, yeah. Bosnian refugees in Ljubljana at that time. And one journalist, uh, uh, Slovenian journalist, uh, uh, wrote for this journal a uh, text. And th this is a quote I will. I will uh, give it, uh, let, let me uh, um, give you the quote. All European states 
with the exception of Great Britain, succumbed to the German onslaught without much visible resistance. Forties. Uh, resistance. Capitul capitulated and soon enough established collabor uh, collaborationist regimes. All these states that are members of the European Union today, with the exception of Churchill's England, and all their neighboring states were fascist states in the 40s. Europe was liberated from these fascist regimes by the English and the Americans. He forgot, <laughs> he forgot, of course, Soviet Union, <laughs> Red Army. <laughs> But anyway, it's a uh, it's symptom, yeah. That is why the only th uh, thing Europeans can celebrate on my, uh, the, the ninth, can be liberation from fascism, but not victory over it. So this is, this is 95, and I'm going back to, to 40, 46. Uh, uh, the thesis is you have heard. Europe had been integrated already in the 40s under the fascism. And who, let me give you a quote, it is um, 46. It is not only the conquest of, Euro, of Europe, what Germany achieved in the 40s, but also the integration of the old continent, the European superstate. It's George Orwell writes 46, already about United Europe <laughs> under Adolf Hitler. So the, this last, uh, th this is by uh, uh, Orwell, and uh, just do you, do you probably know that, that uh, 1940, George Orwell uh, published a text in New English Weekly, his review of the English translation of Mein Kampf, 1940. And it was the second edition of the book, this time issued in a new jacket, uh, uh, jacket explaining that all profits would be devoted to the Red Cross. It's 40. <laughs> and, and it's published here. The first edition, published only a year ago, this is the beginning of the Second World War, 39. Uh, a year ago was edited, as Orwell states, I quote, from a pro-Hitler angle here in, in Britain. Thus, in the year of 39, Adolf Hitler was in Great Britain still respectable. His English publisher, Hart and Black Blackett, tried in the translator's pre uh, pre uh, and Hitler in as kindly a light as possible. The property-owning classes were willing to forgive him almost anything. But for both, left and right, National Socialism was merely a version of conservatism. 39, I'm, this is the beginning of the Second World War. Orwell stresses the fact that the radical change of Hitler's public image from the conservative politician to the dangerous fascists has nothing to do with the change of his ideas. In the contrary, by that time, 39, no real change had taken place in his opinions or political aims for more than 15 years. Well known, 15 years, all the ideas, Orwell writes. A thing that strikes one is the rigidity of his mind, the way in which his worldview doesn't develop, Hitler's. And everybody knew about these ideas. Uh, so there is, there is a certain, what, what uh, uh, Orwell addresses, this is the, the uh, problem of recognizing fascism as fascism. Uh, uh, reading Hitler's Mein Kampf, uh, uh, Orwell uh, uh, writes, uh, this, the book is the fixed vision of a monomaniac and not likely to be much af affected by temporary maneuvers of power politics. The real content of this Hitler's vision is thoroughly stupid. Orwell mocks about the, the, uh, he, uh, Orwell mocks about the future of uh, a state of 250 million Germans with plenty of living room stretching to Afghanistan, a horrible brainless empire in which essentially nothing ever happens except the training of young men for war and the endless breeding of fresh cannon fodder. Orwell shows no interest for Hitler's idea, for his uh, uh, vision, but rather for the image of a person telling, I have a vision. An enormous, 
uh, and he speaks about an, an almost emotional appeal of other other of Hitler. Even he always was attracted by Adolf Hitler. He compares Hitler's image with the picture of Christ crucified. The German dictator makes an impression of an extremely suffering man. He is the martyr, the victim, Prometheus, chained to the rock, the self-sacrificing hero who fights single-handed against impossible odds. And I quote Orwell, if he were killing a mouse, he would know how to make it seem like a dragon. <laughs> One feels that he is fighting against destiny, that he can't win, and yet that he somehow deserves to. Orwell doesn't hesitate to express openly how deeply he feels himself appealed by Adolf Hitler. I should like to put it, I quote, on record that I have never been able to dislike Hitler. But at the same time, Orwell points at something also very interesting. I have reflected that I would certainly kill him if I could get within reach of him. So he likes him, but he would kill him. And just to remind you, uh, you know, Hannah Arendt uh, in, in her Eichmann in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, she, um, she took as motto uh, uh, Bertolt Brecht's uh, 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 a poem, Deutschland bleiche Mutter. Oh, Germany, hearing the speeches that ring from your house, one laughs, but whoever sees you reaches for his knife. So we have again, uh, uh, in, 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 in this uh, problem of recognizing fascism, this is this ambivalence. Uh, it's, it's attractive, but the only way to dealing with it is violence, is brutal violence. Both Orwell says he would kill him, and, and it is about, you know, taking a knife and killing. It's very uh, open. So uh, Orwell criticizes the hedonistic attitude to life, typical for nearly all Western thought uh, in, 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 uh, since, at that time, uh, 40, since the First World War. He mocks about the socialist, who is uh, uh, the socialist who is usually upset when he finds his children playing with soldiers. But this socialist, says Orwell, is never able to think of a substitute for the tin soldiers. Soldiers. On this level, or Orwell uh, makes a difference between socialism and capitalism on one side and fascism on the other. The first two have said to people, "I offer you a good time," but but Hitler has said to them, I offer you, offer you struggle, danger, and death. And as a result, whole nation flings at his feet. Hitler knows that people don't only want comfort, safety, short working hours, hygiene, hygiene, birth control, and in general common sense, they also want struggle and self-sacrifice. This is Orwell. Uh, again, quite ambiguous you know, figure himself. But... Uh, the fact is, uh, actually, the Orwell hasn't uh, mentioned uh, it, uh, but should have mentioned it, that actually communists reacted very early to the challenge of, of fascism. Already 1935, at the 7th Congress of Communist International, Comintern, in Moscow, Georgi Dimitrov, who had his own experiences uh, uh, with, with Hitler uh, and, and, uh, uh, in, in, in Germany, he um, uh, offered a new concept, concept uh, uh, as he believed that would be a political concept that would be uh, uh, able to fight fascism, the uh, concept of the so-called people's, people's front. This is a major, actually, uh, um, move in the history of, of, of uh, uh, communist movement. This is the move from a class struggle to a different idea of political, political struggle. And I'm coming now to our, our uh, uh, topic. Um, so, uh, 
this the policy of the People's Front. It represents an attempt at a fun fundamental correction of the policy of the radical class struggle, which had already been called into question in the face of the fascist challenge. The project of the emancipation of the working class distances itself from the dictatorship of, of the proletariat and aims for the bro broadest possible unity of democratic forces that are prepared to resist fascism. Uh, Dimitrov redefines the notion of the people. The people are all those who fight fascism. And he even, he um, uh, taxatively, you know, uh, um, um, mentions who are the people. Who are the people? People are you, youth, women, farmers, blacks in the USA, manual laborers, Catholic anarchists and unorganized workers, the entire working population, social democrats and independent socialists, churches, intelligentsia, certain sections of the petit bourgeois, oppressed nations of the colonies and semi-colonies, national liberation movements, but also those he calls democratic capitalists become part of, of the people. In Dimitrov's view, they were opposed by a kind of fascist alliance, the rich capitalist landowners, reactionaries of all kinds, banks and corporations, the power of finance capital, and fascist dictatorship in general. What Dimitrov specifically invokes with his anti-fascist strategy is nothing other than a new split in society. Again, we the people means we who fight fascism. As you know, it's, it was already 35. A year later, Spanish Civil War starts. And Spanish Civil War is the defeat, the first defeat of the concept of, of uh, uh, People's Front. But actually, the concept functions perfectly in former Yugoslavia, where on the ground, uh, this, this was the, 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 uh, the concept, that, that had been used concrete, concretely to, to, uh, uh, to fight fascism. And 1943, Yugoslavia uh, had been uh, re, uh, re established by the, by the partisans who, who fought fa fascists on all uh, fronts in former Yugoslavia. And in, 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 in this uh, declaration of Avnoi, which is anti-fascist council of, of, of uh, Yugoslav peoples, uh, there is only one sentence that explains why Yugoslav peoples, nations, should unite in one state. state. This is why, uh, the reason is they fight fascism. This is the only reason. No. Uh, any identity claims whatsoever. No common language, no common history, no common culture, nothing. Purely the fact that they fi fight fascism together suffices to uni unite in, in one state. But, Rasko, the state collapsed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Another defeat. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Boris. Uh, Thank you, Boris. That was great. Uh, I see uh, Bo uh, uh, Boris has warmed you up. Uh, <laughs> but to continue in this style, let's make this dialogue uh, a an agonistic one. Okay, so you quote the, the opening of the book and you stop precisely on the sentence for which I quoted the journalist. The journalist said, as uh, you read, Europe was in, the states of Europe were united under Hitler. That was the first uh, 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 United Europe. And I said, yes, the states, but not Europeans. And as if I, as if I had heard, which I hadn't at that moment, uh, Dave Beach, I didn't use the, the, the expression people. I said, Europeans in anti-fascist movements. So, um, and, of course, this was Georg Dimitrov's um, uh, policy. Uh, this name may not, be, may not be familiar to everybody, so I use my <laughs> pedagogical errors to write it down <laughs> for you. 
uh, Georgi Dimitro was a Bulgarian communist. Um, uh, he was also the star of the Nuremberg trial, where he got acquitted by the Nazi tribunal, which uh, is an achievement, I guess. And um, uh, uh, later, after the war, he was a leading figure of uh, the People's Republic of Bulgaria and considering uh, um, establishing a federation with Yugoslavia. And he died uh, during his uh, visit to Moscow, uh, while um, Comrade Stalin was still alive. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's 1935. Uh, Dimitrov's idea, and that's my second point, where I will I ironize you, you or better Varoufakis. Um, uh, <laughs> Dimitrov's idea is that um, that. Um, Fascism is the transformation of a state form. He introduces this concept of state form, which means transformation of state form. You see the spontaneous fascism. <laughs> so uh, nobody is immune. So, uh, but. It uh, says, uh, um, uh, Dimitro, it's a top-down transformation which finds support in the chaotic, ideologically confused mass movement or mass disillusionment with the existing uh, uh, yeah. state of things. So we have mass, mass movements and it sucks them into this top-down uh, state transformation. Now, another, another theoretician of uh, fascism uh, who wrote after the war and who was working in the state apparatuses of the Nazi state for some time, Alfred Zonneritel, adds an important appendix to this uh, theory. He says, the bourgeoisie, the ruling bourgeoisie is um, is acting from the position of weakness, from a position of weakness. <laughs> so that's important. Weakness and Zoretl, who is a Marxist, uh, says, well, it was a certain fraction of German capital, actually the most developed man with high organic composition of capital. Uh, uh, Boris said not too much theory. So, you know, uh, it was <laughs> uh, the fraction of the most, uh, of the most developed uh, uh, German capital who has invested a lot of money into this modernized uh, Thyssen um, uh, heavy industries, but was not compet uh, could not stand uh, international competition. So they wanted to have a national economy and, if possible, a war economy. Because the good thing about the war economy is that if you are doing war, of course, you need to produce armaments all the time. If you're not doing the war, again, armaments get uh, 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 amortized. They, 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 they get old. You, you invent new, more efficient ones. So the armies have to buy <laughs> armaments all the time. So they wanted to have this kind of um, National economy with a militaristic, uh, militaristic uh, orientation, which precisely the, 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 the movement, uh, uh, the Nazi movement pr uh, provided for. So, uh, weakness. Now, uh, m my point about Varoufakis is this. Uh, what is going on in Europe? State, f transformation of state form. Uh, nation states are being transformed uh, by, by whom? by European, uh, by European uh, bureaucracy, EU bureaucracy, but not from the position of weakness, but from the position of power. So, Europe is doing the fascist task without fascism, as long as it is able to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to act from a position of power. But this, of course, will not last. Not only it is internally uh, challenged, uh, it has already lost the, the, the global competition. It's, it has never catch, caught up with, with the United States, 
uh, or Northern America and Canada, uh, it, 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 it is losing its, oh, has already, has lost. already lost against uh, China and India. So, so, uh, but fortunately we don't have a mass movement of Europeans. We only have national movements of, of this extremist and radical, 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 uh, radical uh, type. But imagine, look, European ideology, EU ideology, which seems to everybody rid ridiculous. It is inherently racist. Yeah. What we have invented everything, we, 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 of, which is open to discussion, but we have uh, conquered the world, which is not open to discussion, more or less. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the European values, what are the, what are the European values? What are the European values? Uh, uh, democracy, uh, uh, tolerance, multiculturalism, you know, everything you, 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 you can put nowadays under um, uh, Je suis Charlie. <laughs> now imagine Je suis Charlie events. You know, uh, there are prominent people doing, uh, uh, um, that are committed to this, uh, to this project. Uh, Madame Merkel, um, Mr. Holland, uh, Netanyahu was there. Uh, so, uh, so, now Europeans is protecting us from fascism as long as it has power, which we don't want. But as long as it doesn't succeed, it's a ideological project which we don't want again. So, now maybe you can... You can <laughs> well, I can... I can... <laughs> so it's viable. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 speaking about theory, how about Adam Smith? Okay. <laughs> Good. Let's, no, 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 no. Let's, <laughs> let's, let, let me say, this is the, this is the problem of, uh, you know, if, if you, uh, in the thesis, how much capitalism, what is implied, is actually the, 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 the thesis that, that uh, fascism is structural element of capitalist mode of production. This is what you want. And you would use Adam Smith, who already claimed that there is an inherent intrinsic tendency in the capitalism to monopolization and that without intervention of the state, the capitalism, as Varoufakis says, you know, has to be saved. <laughs> so it's about state saving the capitalism from itself. This is already Adam Smith and in claiming the Greek state, Varoufakis says, we are better in saving it than, than, uh, than uh, Angela Merkel. Exactly. Exactly. Now, Adam Smith was uh, an incredibly uh, perspicuous person. Um, he, uh, well, his basic idea was, you know, what's, what's free market for, from Adam Smith? Adam Smith is a moralist. He, uh, he wants uh, uh, people to, to, to live better and to develop virtue. Now, um, he has this, uh, you probably know, but let me reiterate. Uh, he has this uh, idea that uh, there are three classes in every society according to the three factors that are needed to, for every production. The one class provides the land and they live off rent because that's the revenue of the land. The other class provides what he, st uh, he calls stock and we call capital and uh, these, these are the investors and they get profits which is revenue of, uh, of, of the investment, of, this, of the capital. And then there's a, the third class which uh, works, uh, which provides labor and they get wages. Uh, now he says, well, those, uh, he then goes into social psychology and says each of those classes has a particular um, way of thinking and of acting. The rentiers have, a, have the most secure and sure and certain income. It comes but by itself, he says, ironically. So they are indifferent and they could make it, uh, could make a, a valuable social contribution, but uh, unfortunately their indifference does not make them very intelligent. So that's his nice uh, 
uh, way of uh, twist. Uh, twist of uh, tackling this aristocracy. Then he says, businessmen, capitalists, these are the worst type of people. They have only this individual, individual interest. They cannot think in the terms of society because their way of thinking is how to make profit of the stock they possess. So they are dangerous, they talk the most, the most, you know, uh, and uh, well, he, he kind of um, says, and people listen to them, which is a shame. And, uh, and they are I important. So they have influence. And then he says, well, workers, you know, first they are brutal, uh, 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 abruti in French, brutal, uh, they, yeah, uh, uh, brutalized by, uh, by their work. They cannot develop their intellectual potential. They have the interest, of course, that the whole society prospers because their prosperity depends on the whole society prospering. But unfortunately, nobody listens to them. So what is the Adam Smith medicine for this undisciplined business class, capitalist class? It's free market. Let them kill each other in competition. They will discipline the, uh, themselves by <laughs> forming the average profit rate. So everybody will get the same profit and they will kind of, you know. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's his model. And it's interesting because uh, free market, uh, Adam Smith is, the ideal, uh, is today uh, the argument of neoliberalism. He, he has a different uh, view. He doesn't, well, he knows monopolies, etc. But he's, he, he, he could never have imagined what we have today. So he thinks that uh, uh, formation of profit rate, which is the, 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 the um, result of general competition, will discipline uh, the, the um, private investors. Now, the, the other thing is that Adam Smith rightly considers that private capital is not strong enough to make uh, certain investments like infrastructure. So that has to be provided by the state. And, uh, and uh, this is what we have today. The state is doing the big investments, which are later uh, used uh, for private profit. Profit, profit. We call it private <laughs> public partnership, but it's not a <laughs> but it's not a partnership because you know <laughs> one side loses, the other side gains. It's kind of bizarre partnership. So, so nevertheless, let's uh, let's come to the back to the fascism. Uh, when does uh, the need for for state intervention in fascist in fascist or Nazi uh, uh, mode uh, occurs when the profit rate is false. False. And where is the profit rate falling today? In the so-called ex-West, former West. It's not falling down, and not importantly, in the New East, the, the Asia Pacific. No, no. Look, uh, what do you do? This look, is look. This is the former look, falling profit rate. Is now, the one, of the, <laughs> one of the problems I had with this book is that you shouldn't. Well, there is a saying in our languages. I don't know. You probably have. You shouldn't uh, paint the devil on the wall. You know, which because he will come. Uh, so my problem is writing this book was more or less the same. And what I am doing now is painting the devil on the wall. So you should stop me. <laughs> Before I stop you, uh, uh, back to the to the state, to the form of state. This is this is crucial. Uh, the global capitalism, nation state, allegedly has been weakened, etc., etc. Which is of course not truth. Uh, uh, state, the role of the state in uh, global capitalism, the role of the state uh, 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 within the neoliberal tra transformation has changed. And the collapse of communism was one event in the chain of these events of the transformation of the state under the s in the context of, of uh, uh, global capitalist transformation. How did or how has uh, the state changed from we all somehow know it's a, it, it moved from one function into another from welfare state that the, was based on the ideal, may I say ideal of solidarity or regulative uh, redistribution of, uh, principle of, of solidarity to, uh, to the role of, of a policeman. 
that that now when 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 the the the, the market uh, 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 produces conflicts necessarily someone has to take care of peace tolerance uh, etc yeah but as as long as the state um, provides this how would you say civilized uh, repression uh, you would have this liberal um, liberal uh, type of uh, state of emergency actually uh, uh, which is um, what we have now um, exporting conflict to to the margins of Europe to to Middle East, to to uh, North Africa to Middle East to Ukraine, Ukraine. and uh, uh, rep um, uh, developing uh, measures of constraint and control and discipline uh, in the name of conflict with I mean in, co in the name of conflict with our neighbors. Uh, I put it this way to, to show you the absurdity of, uh, of the political project. Uh, but on the other side, uh, 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 this uh, liberal state, uh, is, uh, which is not only police, it's also the guardian of the market uh, against monopolies. It's uh, ordo liberalism, the, the German uh, doctrine of the 30s, uh, where um, the state was conceived as the guardian of the market because market was uh, was uh, understood as something very fragile, which actually is because spontaneous working of the market uh, leads towards monopolies. Uh, so, um, so um, um, uh, uh, as uh, as long as the state can uh, can uh, can um, provide those two functions, policing and. Um, Defense of the regulation, regulation of the market, uh, free and unhampered market, uh, um, uh, com uh, competition uh, libre et non fossé. That's in European jargon. Uh, so um, uh, it can uh, it can remain on this liberal liberal uh, uh, liberal type of uh, constraint discipline and control. And of course, we, we are used to it, so maybe we will sooner or later find um, ways of resisting it. Uh, but then uh, it's not likely that uh, present states or present European construction will, uh, will carry on, will be able to, 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 pro to, to, to provide this role for a longer time. And uh, the question is, whether by our resisting uh, the liberal, uh, the liberal um, uh, state, which for a thousand reasons we are justified not to like, whether we are not uh, uh, inviting the, the devil to enter. <coughs> Uh, uh, let's come back to the to the uh, uh, tendency of the uh, f uh, fall of profit profit rate. Um, uh, uh, looking from the from from Europe, from the from the old continent that has become so powerful and and rich, uh, precisely on the ground of its colonial imperial history, and now in the post colonial post colonial uh, uh, world, and being challenged by other markets, by other uh, 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 subjects, capitalist subjects, what happens when the colonies are not available no longer? What and profit rates is falling? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Look, Europe has lost its global struggle, and we are we are happy about that. But it has not given up the project of imperialism. Uh, there is a wonderful book by, well, uh, let me quote another author, uh, Fra uh, Fernand Brodel is a French, very important French, uh, French uh, historian. His books are not easy to read because uh, you are losing the forest because he is presenting the trees. But um, but he has a nice, uh, a ni a nice book uh, called Italian Model. It's about proto-capitalism in Italian cities. And he says, well, when, it, when the center of, um, of economic uh, initiative shifted to, to, to the Atlantic, Italy lost its importance. 
it was no more in the struggle for for uh, for world for what was called world domination, which means European domination anymore. And that was the first time when Italy was able to produce enough food <laughs> for its consumption. It was it was the 16th century uh, when Spaniards installed uh, uh, installed uh, Medici as the um, Dukes of Florence. So basically, Italian was out. It, Italy was out economically and politically. But it was the, the, a century of high renaissance and economic um, flourishing of Italy. So Europe has not opted for this way. <coughs> Europe opted, or European Union opted for the Spanish model. Spaniards were the strongest military power of their time in the 16th century. They were waging wars all around. And finally, they uh, succeeded to, to underdevelop uh, their country into the third world, which it is now. So. <laughs> Sorry, <coughs> but basically, yeah, why? Why? Because it's becoming the uh, economy of Northern Europe, as is Greece, as is former Yugoslavia, as is Italy without knowing it, and Portugal. So, Thanks. when you don't give up imperialist project and you cannot impose it on the whole world, what do you do? You kind of self-reflectively <laughs> self turn it into yourself, and Europe is creating internal colonies. And it's happening under our own eyes. Greece is a people which is being parasited by, by European banks. Uh, for permanent, if, if this arrangement does not change, it will be for permanence, forever. Of course it won't be for, forever. But the, it cannot be resolved within the frame that, is been, that has been imposed upon Greece uh, by the Troika uh, or by the institutions. <laughs> but uh, uh, tell me how to, uh, OK, there, is, there are, uh, in, <coughs> within Europe, imminent colonial relations have been is established as a consequence of the crisis of European model of capitalism. Uh, how does the story about victory over totalitarian communist rule, liberation of the Eastern Europe, uh, how does it fit into, into this story? Yeah, look. Um, at the end of the 80s, a kind of domino effect happened, which showed you that our notions were of understanding the world, our schemata, were wrong. Um, uh, Soviet Union collapsed. Um, in certain socialist countries like uh, Yugoslavia, we never considered ourselves part of the Soviet Empire, but Yugoslavia collapsed as well. Socialism collapsed, Federation collapsed. Then social democrats never thought they had anything in common with the communists. And what did, what was the effect, or what was the next domino that fell? Social democrats. All over the world, social democrats became social liberals or whatever, uh, the third war, uh, way, etc. So, uh, some, something much, uh, much deeper than to totalitarianism is going on. And, um, um, there is a Slovene cardinal uh, who represents the Catholic cardinal. Yeah, Catholic cardinal who represents the conservative, <laughs> very radical conservative wing. We call them clerofascists. Yeah, okay, you call them clerofascists. So <laughs> this guy, um, but he has an extreme position and a, a, a clear perspective. He, he said, at a very early stage in the 90s, he said, it's not the fall of communism, it's the fall of the Enlightenment project which, of course, he was thinking is playing into his hands. Uh, and that's true. It's, it's, it's a, an epochal change. Well not, to, well, not to be too apocalyptic. There is, a, there is another much, uh, much, much more rationalistic theory which says capitalism is moving, uh, is moving in cycles. 
and the cycles are getting slow, uh, shorter and shorter. Uh, that was the Italian proto-capitalist cycle, then the Dutch cycle, then the British cycle, then the American, and we are somewhere here, and nobody knows whether in China a new cycle is uh, starting. So uh, if we look at this, I think that then to totalitarianism is a regional uh, ideolo ideology which actually masked the annexation of eastern provinces. This is, you, uh, this is how, how you call the enlargement of the European Union exactly, yeah. towards the, the, the East and uh, yeah. accepting the former uh, uh, communist states. Yeah, yeah, and ex accession, or accession, the accession was... Uh, and then uh, uh, um, <laughs> la finalité de projet, <laughs> where it stops, where are the limits, Ukraine, East Ukraine. Is it a fascism? Well, um, yeah, Ukraine is an interesting uh, is an interesting case, which actually confirms this kind of uh, of um, of collage theory of fascism here. Um, it's a failed nation state. It's a nation state which um, uh, was unable to form a national bourgeoisie. Uh, the uh, ruling groups are not are not a class. It's a kind of predatory. Uh, we call them oligarchs. Yeah, well, yeah, tycoons, oligarchs, whatever. Yeah, that's how people call them, and that's a popular. It's quite, uh, quite, uh, quite intelligent. Yeah. So they are predatory, a predatory class, and what they can, uh, they, uh, in, in, in their project now, the half of the project of this predatory class is to become co comprador bourgeoisie vis-à-vis um, uh, -vis European Union. And probably the, the other part wants to do the same. Uh, um, with the support of Russia. So uh, you have a, a new type of, uh, of um, ruling class, comprador bourgeoisie, which has developed in, in colonies and ex-colonies. Um, and they are the weaker class. They are the, the weak bourgeoisie. And in Slovenia and in Croatia, and probably in all former Yugoslavia, the fascist mass movements were supported by the weaker, by the groups that were to become comprador bourgeoisie, which is in power now. Uh, uh, in the during the 90s. But isn't we it, didn't know that, of course. But isn't the fact that they are compradorial uh, elites, that they are um, uh, uh, under control of the Western liberal model, so-called values, so that they cannot exactly cannot what you what you say um, use what you say surplus violence. I mean they have been yeah. using it quite a lot in former Yugoslavia. You know, the, all the atrocities, Srebrenica, Sarajevo. You you have seen this surplus violence, uh, fascist surplus violence in Ukraine, in the in the in the uh, 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 northern Africa, etc. But. This is the logic. This is the logic of the so-called liberal elites when they say from Ukraine to all over the, the uh, uh, East European, former East space, it is the Europe that guarantees, that will save us yeah. and protect us from falling into fascism. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's why I say that Europe is doing the, the task of fascism without surplus violence. Even though, I mean, you know, Surplus violence is a tricky term. I mean, how many people have died too early because social uh, security and health, uh, public health have gone apart? I mean, in, in Russia, uh, people were calculating it's about 600,000 to 700,000 people have died in Russia because health service, uh, public health service has fallen apart. But during the 90s, the future uh, Comprador bourgeoisie was in a weaker position, at least in, Yugo in Yugoslavia, against national bourgeoisie information, which was the former uh, political bureaucracy of the socialist one-party regime plus the managerial elite. And they had a serious, a serious uh, project to make a nation states with national bourgeoisies. And they were quite successful, only that probably the times, historical moment is not good enough for, for such a project. 
you cannot have nation, national economy anymore, especially if you are, you are a country like Croatia or Serbia or Bosnia, small countries. So, uh, but, uh, but in Yugoslavia, there was, you know, in other countries, the, 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 the weapon of Comprador bourgeoisie against the socialist elites was uh, illustration. In Yugoslavia, there was no illustration. There was fascism or fascist policy from the weak uh, uh, parts of Comprador bourgeoisie to in, in becoming, and a very liberal approach by the then ruling national bourgeoisie. And the success story of Slovenia is linked to the post-communist um, managerial and political elites. There were people who were ruling uh, all the time uh, uh, from the 70s on, and they were, they were good at doing it. <laughs> well, but this project, of course, and look, these are local stories, but it's very interesting. During the 90s, in the name of accession to European Union, a class compromise was formed between national bourgeoisie in, in becoming and um, the workers' movement, the trade unions. Uh, it, it probably was, was a right, uh, rather typical post-colonial situation that you have the working masses who support the national bourgeoisie because they think they, are, they will establish a national economy where redistribution will, uh, will be, will be, uh, can be arranged. Uh, so the, well, they, uh, the working masses, in, in, at least in Slovenia, uh, were... were uh, uh, were, uh, were bearing the burden of accession conditions in the name of uh, uh, joining European Union. And the result of joining European Union is, of course, national bourgeoisie is out, compared bourgeoisie is on power, and trade unions are in, well, um, are now undergoing European destiny. Not in all. In not in all <coughs> Eastern European uh, countries this uh, uh, model has succeeded. Some has succeeded in forming their own national bourgeoisie. Well, Hungary? Exactly, Hungary, no, no. Orban wouldn't be anti-democratic if he had a national bourgeoisie behind him. He has a political project without class uh, support. That's why he has to control the media, you know, to flood with the, with the fascist uh, uh, parties, uh, etc. It's a f it's a, they, they sold their national economy at the very beginning. They have no economic uh, uh, basis for, for creating national bourgeoisie. But politically, they still have not, or at least Fidesz hasn't seen, it has not realized the historical situation. So they, they, they're kind of, you know, desperate, desperate fascist politics because they're behind the, the, the history, but you should never say that. I mean, Germany has also lost its uh, struggle for, for global uh, domination in the, uh, with the First World War. And still this political project was able to foment the Second World War. So Orban is... This surviving, uh, this, yeah. this discrepancy uh, between classically, you know, material conditions and the way and the cautiousness, the way how people think and how they behave, yeah. uh, how they form politics, it's a classical problem. And this is now uh, precisely in talking about fascism, this is the role of, you would say, cultural bureaucracy, of culture, of ideology, of what is, uh, of course, connected to all these conditions, market and economic conditions, but has always had certain um, own, its, its own logic in, in development. How does this role the role of, I, I use the word of elites, uh, you, you, you call it cultural bureaucracies, how, uh, how it relates to the danger of fascism and survival and of fascism, of, of yeah, fascist yeah. Danger, uh, danger. Yeah. I would first make a, a, another note on, on the present uh, Hungarian regime, namely um, 
uh, Fidesz government became problematic for the European Union only at the moment when they put uh, uh, central bank under the political control, which is <laughs> when they introduced the classical nation state situation. <laughs> you know, <laughs> central banks in the so called welfare state were always under political control. That was the, one of the most important uh, levels of. Uh, of uh, of uh, redis uh, redistribution of, uh, of riches. So, uh, but when, when they were cleansing the institu cultural uh, uh, media institutions of, of their liberals, left liberals, it was not the problem for European Union. Not un until uh, the, the Central Union, Bank. And of course, started this um, democratic rhetoric. So that's about Hungary. So, you know, f sooner or later, uh, European Central Bank will have to be put under political control. And maybe Orban is uh, uh, the avant-garde, not the residuum, you know, not this kind of uh, ethnographic left over curiosity. <laughs> yeah. But uh, speaking about uh, cultural bureaucracy, my book is basically a polemics against uh, um, educational system, uh, cultural institutions, and uh, uh, national culture which was turning into ideological uh, apparatus exactly if uh, i may uh, say ideological apparatus is conceptually speaking yes and uh, against nat national culture that was turning into a, a cultural fascism at that moment so uh, what is cultural fascism uh, i think this is huh. Now, look, you said not too much theory, but <laughs> uh, look, uh, there are two ways of, uh, two ways of, uh, of uh, forming a nation in Europe. One is top-down, as in uh, France. You know, you have a state, and then the state uh, needs some uh, social support and um, forms a nation to, 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 to support this administrative construction. And this is um, the nation-state. Uh, with national language, the state prescribes what is right to say and what is not, etc. So that's the French model. Now the other model is the German model. You know, you have uh, very many small, small uh, feudal unities, uh, 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 um, kingdoms, and um, uh, whatever. So um, you don't have a unified state, but you have a un united culture. And uh, um, yeah, you have the German culture. You have a romantic. It's a romantic project. It's a, you have not culture, spirit. They called it spirit, oh, yeah, yeah. Guys, national yeah. spirit. Yeah. But even the Humboldt's uh, 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 definition of language is that it uh, articulates the spirit, unique German national spirit. So, this is yeah. the so so uh, it's the culture that integrates the the people, and it's the then that the state comes from this already unified social field. And Croats, Serbs, uh, Bulgarians, um, Slovenes, Czechs. Well, Czechs are well, Czechs are, uh, a superpower in the Middle Ages, so we should <laughs> speak about that. Uh, but m those small nations are the German type of uh, uh, nation states. Um, so my my idea is that big spirit and small spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, my uh, now uh, now there's uh, I should enter into some theory. Uh, uh, sh sh should I? A bit? Yeah. I, uh, no, 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 no. I'll, that's clear. Uh, look. Um, Secret goes away. Uh, right. You know. Uh, you said we were Lacanians at that time, and uh, Lacan is a uh, uh, is certain retour of Freud, so it's uh, coming back to Freud. And um, I think that for fascism, um, uh, mass and psychology and ich analyse, mass psychology and uh, analysis of the self or the ego is still valid. So the great, the great, um, uh, the great theoretical invention of Freudism, or of Sigmund Freud, is the distinction between subject and the self, or the ego, or the ich. You know, all the standard psycholo psychology uh, uh, 
does not make this distinction. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in Freud, uh, it happened, uh, you know, it, it, it happened, uh, um, how do I say, historically, biographically. Uh, uh, at a certain moment, uh, when, the, uh, when they already had the idea of unconscious, Freud and his friend Breuer, Joseph Breuer, were practicing hypnosis because the idea was that uh, the symptom is the consequence of a repressed trauma, and if you re can reanimate the trauma, the trauma exp uh, event, uh, re experience, uh, you will liberate, the subject will liberate herself. They were mostly hysteric women. Um, but don't be right, uh, one of them was Bertha Pappenheim. Um, Anna Ho. The big, uh, Anna Ho, the big uh, philanthropist. Uh, who actually kicked Brian and, and Freud and went <laughs> out of the analysis, and that was a very good move from her side. So, but, <laughs> but, but uh, Freud was able to, to think about it. Now, they were, they were, they were practicing hypnosis to uh, reanimate the traumatic event, because we, under hypnosis, people become uh, um, uh, uh, manageable, manipulable, and uh, the, the blocks, the sensors fall down. Now, um, um, hypnosis is an ego mechanism. It, 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 it uh, resides on what Freud uh, nicely calls Verliebheit, which is understandable to, into English. It's not love, it's <laughs> Verliebheit, what's Verliebheit? Falling in love. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's kind of a condition, constant condition of being dis disposable to love. Yeah. Falling <laughs> constantly in love. <laughs> so, so at, uh, at a certain moment, uh, when the patient was um, lifted out of the hypnosis, this uh, young woman embraced Freud. And Freud had a very witty note. <laughs> a note, he says, I, not for a moment I was ascribing this gesture to my attraction, attractiveness. So he started to think about it. And he developed the theory of transference. Transference, which means this special, special uh, relation between the patient the, uh, and uh, the, the analyst, ther the, yeah, and the analyst uh, which is the basis of psychoanalytical process. So you have theory of transference, first that's theta, that's theory, and only with this theory you, you can have practice that is able to act a I part. I told you, I told you, the theory is dangerous. Look, yeah. Okay. We, are, we are so um, far away from fascism. No, no, fascism is here. That is not it. <laughs> Now, the, the, my idea of fascism is this. Fascism is mass psychology. It's manipulating with ego, uh, ego um, um, processes, um, ego mechanisms. It is relatively superficial, which means that people who are nice and, uh, and, uh, and uh, sociable and uh, behave themselves can become fascists. I mean, that's a very trivial ex experience. All of a sudden, they show a side which is violent, uh, intolerant, etc. But it doesn't affect subjective, deep psychological mechanisms, which means, which is not a good news, which means <laughs> that fascism can plant itself to a multiplicity of subjective processes which are, by definition, idiosyncratic and dependent of the unique uh, personal history of every subject. So, that is why various theories of, of, of um, fascism give you kind of false ecran types of... Uh, screen. Of uh, screen types, sorry, yeah. There may be more French. Uh, uh, screen types of explanation, which are tenor you. I don't know. <laughs> which are, <laughs> sorry? Tenor you, it, 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 uh, it takes hold. Yeah, it takes hold, it uh, takes place of the true explanation. You know, they say it's petty bourgeois mentality. 
or they say it's disillusionment in the class politics of the proletariat. That's Clara Zetkin's formulation from the early 20s, speaking about Mussolini. Uh, or they say as Adorno, it's this horrible patriarchal families that, uh, you know, um, breed pathological subjects, uh, which was true for Hitler. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, all those explanations are true. But we could carry on, because this ego mechanism of hypnosis, of mass psychology, can, can uh, plant itself, you know, can make itself being supported by various uh, uh, unconscious subje subjective um, mechanisms or processes, unconscious processes. Um, that is why I don't like types of, uh, you know, uh, 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 types of explanation like Wilhelm Reich or, or, or Mar uh, Herbert Marcuse. These were great figures. I mean, Wilhelm Reich succeeded to be kicked out of the Communist Party and the International Psychological Association at the same year. And I call that an achievement. Uh, so uh, so uh, they are great. But they disc you know, they go too, 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 too deep. Fascism is here, as Freud uh, rightly saw. And that's, that's, this, uh, that's why it is dangerous. There is no immunity that would be granted in, uh, beforehand. And, um, and uh, in, yes. Yeah, was, Just, yes. Can I just ask a question? In the, in the analytic situation, the way in which you break a transference is through an interpretation that produces a cut and produces an effect of uh, the subjective division. So I'm wondering whether that might be a point of resistance in relation <laughs> to fascism, to think what would be, you know, uh, produce a subjective division or make the subject feel their division rather than this transferential love. Exactly. Look, but the problem is <laughs> that, uh, that those... Uh, that in a pro uh, psychoanalytic uh, process, you never know where, where this, you know, associative process will have structural effect. Mm -hmm. You know, it, sometimes it happens very soon, sometimes it, it doesn't happen for years. And the other uh, the problem is that it's idiosyncratic. In politics, you're not, you know, you cannot deal with um, how many Germans? 20 million, 40 million, 6, 80 million, you know. It's too much, so uh, too many. Uh, uh, but then, of course, it happens here. But, but maybe I'm just thinking of, uh, in terms of culture, and yeah. art. This is the place, perhaps, of art to produce subjective effects, which problematizes meaning. For instance, produces the uncertainty of meaning. Just, I'm just thinking of uh, ways in which you might cut yeah. the Look, brains of immanence yeah. that are caught up with the ego. Exactly. That's a that's yeah. That's a very good idea because my theory was just the opposite. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> no, no, I mean we are on the same field. <laughs> uh, uh, what I saw was that uh, sorry, no irony. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, my, my idea w was that the type of ego constitution, which was favorite, fav which was preferred or favored through the schooling apparatus, especially elementary school, which, you know, grabs everybody, uh, via national literature, via um, the special mix of uh, written and oral culture, which uh, national uh, literature presupposes. Namely, you are supposed to be able to read the canonic uh, texts, and you're supposed to be able to discuss them, to interpret them, and you are not supposed to write anything like a canonic text. So you have a particular mix of uh, written and oral, and both are uh, axed upon authoritarian, uh, authorita authoritarian structure, which means somebody will, is, the school is going to tell you what are canonic texts, and you are not going to, to read others. And uh, secondly, of course, you may interpret it whatever way you want. But of course, you never do it because the tracks are already there and they've been subtly introduced into your mind. So my idea was that the literary national culture was the, the, the productive support or 
yeah, uh, uh, upon which a, a, a fascist appeal or interpolation, to use the concept, uh, was, uh, was able to, to work upon. So, so, yeah. Yes. Um, we, we could have, uh, <laughs> we, can, we, we can just uh, discuss it, uh, uh, I don't know, for hours. Uh, I'm inviting you to, uh, yes, Mao, first question. Oh, thank you. The, can you hear me? Yeah. There was a great um, um, talk performance. Um, I want to go back to the, the, the relationship between state and violence. And um, Adam Smith wrote uh, uh, something called a Treatise on Jurisprudence, which was a, a not well-known book, which is a basically a treatise on policing, where he talked about how the state should police everything, from street lights to uh, how to disperse crowded demonstrators. So in a way, capitalism, even in its theory, has always been associated with uh, uh, police violence or violence. And in fact, the theory of imperialism is about that. It's about state, nation state that expand uh, globally. Uh, of course, for Lenin, the problem was how to catch up with that. Um, so I think uh, uh, perhaps you can think about, uh, I don't know if the notion of how much fascism is really the, the right question. Maybe you can think about how much capitalism <laughs> and the second thing is uh, about Europe. Uh, the first time the notion of Europe came out historically was uh, with the Treaty of Westphalia, which was a peace treaty among nations. It was the first time nations recognized the sovereignty of other nations in a moment of peace, which obviously started, that was supported by the national bourgeoisie, and that was the end of the old order that you were describing, the 17th century order. And the, the, the start of imperialism on a global scale. So. Um, I wonder whether we can think about Europe as a, as a formation in permanent state of crisis that is precisely so uh, resilient because of this ongoing crisis. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a very good idea uh, to link uh, Europe to, to, uh, to capitalism, to the international system, and to permanent crisis. I mean, permanent crisis is not necessarily something bad. Uh, it makes... Um, an arrangement, a, re a regulation much lighter to support from, from the below than if you have a consolidated uh, a structure. Uh, and secondly, that's why it's so resilient, as you said. But uh, now we are, we are approaching the, uh, the end of the, let's say, Euro-Atlantic types of capitalism, which started precisely in the 17th century with the Dutch, uh, uh, capitalism continued with the British and ended with uh, the American, the United States hegemony. So uh, is Europe going to survive it? And uh, I suggested the Italian way, which means that <laughs> let's, let's embrace arts and uh, spiritual, uh, 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 spiritual uh, activities and produce food. Uh, Finally, for not no, only for no, that is also but for against fascism. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, or else you have this another model. And there is a permanent ambivalence within European Union itself. Uh, and uh, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, it was not like it is now. So, of, of course, it's, it's open for the debate. Please, mm. yes, please. Hi. Um, you mentioned briefly um, in your talk, you mentioned the Je suis Charlie. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about that in relation to um, the, the current presence of fascism in, in Europe. And um, yeah, I was just interested in that in relation to what you were discussing more kind of currently. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Look, Je suis Charlie, um, let me take, look, uh, it's, a, it's, a <laughs> it's an irritant question, because I'm not go I, uh, uh, I'm far away from defending terrorist violence and, you know, killing journalists, etc. But, um, um, so let me take a more theoretical approach. Je suis Charlie is a type of expression like, we are, nous sommes tous des juifs allemands, which was, um, a slogan of uh, uh, French we, we all are. We are all German Jews, Jews. Uh, which was um, 
which was the slogan of the demonstrations in Latin Quarter uh, on the f f 31st May 68. And it was a rebuttal of, of, um, of uh, an utterance ascribed to the Minister of Interior <coughs> of, uh, of the French government at that time, uh, who uh, explained that the student uh, rebellion is uh, led by a German Jew, which of course is a mystification. Uh, Daniel Combandy, uh, which is a mystification. A French minister would never say it, and you won't find it in the archives. Uh, I, I was looking for it. But what I found was an utterance by the sec uh, Secretary General of the French Communist Party, Georges Marchais, who said, it's a German anarchist who leads the student revolt. And saying a, a German, of course, appeals to French nationalism. Saying an anarchist um, appeals to sp specific um, communist hatred of anarchists. That goes back to Marx. Uh, and Bakunin. Uh, so, uh, so it was, uh, uh, but it caught, this slogan caught the, the, the idea of the situation and it has this impact of, uh, of constructing a we with an impossible predication. You know, mostly French and Francophone students were calling they are all German Jews. This impossible predication was the one that uh, constructed the we, and Ranciere uh, made uh, a nice text about it. Uh, now, Je suis Charlie is a, a sort of paraphrase without we, and with identification with the predication with which I wouldn't identify myself. I mean, I look, <laughs> there are people who believe. There are people who are, you know, coming to age, confronting death, and who sincerely believe. And as, oh well, I, now I quote Pope Francesco. <laughs> <laughs> Since I'm quoting Cardinal. Pope Francesco said with this special uh, special frastic accent. <laughs> you should not, you should not hurt religious feelings. <laughs> you know, he, he said it better. <laughs> but uh, I agree. You should not hurt religious feelings. So uh, you know those caricatures of Muhammad, the, the prophet, are really bad taste, if not more. So. So, Je suis Charlie is actually presenting this dark side of Europe. We are Democrats, we have freedom of speech, they have no democracy, they have no freedom of speech. We have religious tolerance, <laughs> probably, <laughs> you know, so. But, um, but it's interesting for semiotic reasons. It's interesting for semiotic reasons. Why Muslim to the Juif Allemand uh, works in one sense and Je suis Charlie makes it, uh, works in, in a different direction. Um, yes, please. Um, Mike, is the... Uh, oh, sorry, 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 you are the next, sorry. I haven't seen it. Yes, please. Yes, I would like to continue with the uh, notion of the production of ideology and, and also in relations to the possibility of of art um, as a resistance to uh, to fascism that was now brought up. I'm also thinking here because I'm thinking of the uh, the project that the European Commission launched a couple of years ago, which is called a new narrative for Europe, mm -hmm. and in which I mean this is then um, um, it's signed by. Pr um, pr prominent uh, cultural figures like Rem Kohlhaas and, and Olaf Eliasson. And in this, um, what they state then, um, under the heading of the mind and body of Europe, is amongst other things. Europe is a state of mind formed and fostered by its spiritual, philosophical, artistic and scientific inheritance and driven by the lessons of history. 
And I wonder, is this really a, a development that we should affirm? Or rather, perhaps be very careful of, of constructing that kind of we. To me, it seems to be quite, quite, quite obvious that it's, it's, it's late. Uh, let me answer first, because this is a question for Boris. He is the specialist of memory and, uh, and these uh, things. But uh, look, uh, I now looked into my notes, and uh, I had here, the, uh, I have written here that the, the art may intervene here, then you uh, overtook me and I've forgotten my note. So uh, the art can intervene here and uh, it's not necessary that it touches the subject. It's uh, enough to, 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 to break this subject ego, ego, uh, ego um, link, uh, amalgamation, which is our everyday experience. So since uh, uh, the art, the, the gesture of art is ostranienie. How do you say? Estrangement. Estrangement. Est estrangement. Shklovsky, uh, we were yeah. yesterday uh, it's Estrangement, uh, it's at least since uh, the beginning of the 20th century. But um, I guess, I mean, I could show you Renaissance, Renaissance paintings that do the same. Uh, but <laughs> still, so uh, the art c actually can do it, but it's a separation, it's a separation function. It's not a synthesis in the type of narrative. Uh, um, I think that uh, the, the, the progressive, uh, progressive uh, politics uh, progresses, develops itself through separations, through, through breaking this uh, amal amalgams through which uh, through which uh, dangerous social uh, social uh, uh, processes and mechanism proceed, but Boris is the well, novice ipsis silamus. You are. Uh, yeah. I, I I won't. Uh, uh, we can, I can privately with, because uh, um, more questions on the on the topic. Yes. Ah, uh, just <laughs> sorry, Jan. Yeah. Uh, Where is the mic? Microphone. Ah, yeah, okay. You, I have, yeah. Yes, um, please. Yeah, so basically this will be maybe yeah. less a question than um, I simply feel obliged to share here with the audience because I, I would assume that most of them... Could you a little bit louder, haven't, please? Yeah, haven't heard. Okay. So that most of the audience have, uh, hasn't heard of the, uh, the epitome of fascism in the Balkans uh, called uh, Skopje 2014. It's an architectural redevelopment project. I'm lucky enough, or by the time I finish saying this, maybe you say I'm unlucky enough to share the same um, cultural heritage with you. So I come from former Yugoslavia and precisely Macedonia. So uh, basically in uh, 2012, we have um, monuments that basically are amalgamation of fascism that you spoke about and public art that we spoke before the break, before the lunch break. So uh, I don't know if you can see the picture. So I <laughs> <seen it. laughs> I wish I could show it there. Yeah. So basically this is a, a copy of Arno Brecker's Hitler's favorite sculptor, which is being built in 2012 uh, funded by the public without their consent or any sort of input. Um, yeah, by our government, it's just a bit um, more pop, more kitsch. I mean, by the, n by the international <coughs> press, the, the entire project, I mean, maybe you can, people that are online can uh, input a uh, in their search, Skopje 2014, to see what I'm talking yeah. about. So, since you mentioned Prometheus uh, before. Yeah. Okay, uh, can you quickly answer the, the, the question and we close? The uh, no, I, uh, I, I know what you're talking about, but uh, my, I still have this problem. Uh, it is kitsch, it's not art. Uh, and and it's we, an should, it's we should. Fascist. Yeah, why is it? You know, why do you perceive it as a kitsch? Instantly, intuitively. I was tying in more onto the fascism than, uh -huh, okay. than the kitsch. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Um, look, um, look I, would, I would say that this still comes from the special situation in which Macedonia finds find itself. Um, it still has not got a name. I yes. mean, for, as an outsider, I think this is a very defining, defining uh, um, um, situation. And we are speaking about Greece. <laughs> you know, who is preventing Macedonia to have a name? It's not called uh, Macedonia, it's called Phyrom, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Well, I mean, what the hell? For who well, the yeah. country itself prevents itself uh, uh, from yearns so much to become part of EU, but does everything against it by building you know, uh, <laughs> nationalist theme park, Disney World uh, uh, architecture. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. We will. That, uh, last, last uh, question. Yeah, well, Do you have a, a mic? Yeah, it will come. Yeah, it's coming. We will. Yeah, it, it, it is coming. It. We will then close. Yeah, here, Jan. I have uh, listened to uh, to the dialogue. Uh, with pleasure, with interest. Uh, it's too late for uh, a question, so I have a short comment. Uh, the whole discussion has been basically focused on the state, uh, the state in Europe. Uh, of capital. The idea that the state is all dictating, is all imposing, may be misleading. Uh, what we see is that the state has become a handmaiden of capital and of capitalism. And fascism is not only now promoted or controlled on the basis of state formation, but on the basis of uh, capitalist coalitions and alliances. And that role of capitalism in the promotion of fascism is not so much in the European history, but in the globalization process, that is a very vital force. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this. This opens so a, new, uh, a new horizon, <laughs> and I agree with you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for and. Uh,